The idea of this discussion, we usually have one of these every restaurant spaces, and the idea is to sort of have a bit of a discussion with a bunch of people uh, and, you know, covering the diverse elements of our audience uh, to talk about many of the themes that we're going to be pulling apart while uh, we're here in Miami. So uh, that's what we're doing today. Quick um, uh, sort of announcement. Kim Ellis, unfortunately, was meant to be joining us, but she uh, is unable to join us for this session. But um, we're still going to have a great time, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the idea. So uh, so we know uh, who everyone is and just sort of the like how varied we are right now. Uh, we're going to do some introductions. So um, Phil, sure. I'll pass it on to you and you can kick it off. Uh, can you tell us you know, your name, where you're from, a bit about your company, and maybe a bit about where you've come from as well over your, your years, but don't go too long. Um, <laughs> And uh, well. <laughs> uh, and then also, you know, what are you focused on right now? That's a lot of questions for me to start with. Well, yeah, I mean, the test is, is you know, can you remember it? No, I won't. Okay. All right, so I'm Phil Crawford. I uh, come from Franklin, Tennessee, not too far away. I head up technology for Carl's Jr. and Hardee's, otherwise known as CKE Restaurants. I've been in the hospitality space for a couple of years. I want to date myself with my age. Thank you very little. Um, I love, by the way, the, the blue shag carpet. Yeah. I do want to go. You're welcome. It's very nice of you. Mm -hmm. um, look, my background's been in, in this industry from Darden Restaurants, which we a small little brand called Yard House, to Shake Shack, to Godiva, to now here. And always been heavily focused on technology and what we can do to continue to reinvent the hospitality space, specifically restaurants, whether it be you know, fast casual or QSR. And the great part about this entire thing is just sharing the knowledge that we can to move the industry forward for the longest time the restaurant space has been so far behind another, another vertical market. So for us to take the other initiatives we've got, put them to fruition and grow them, absolutely, that's what we're here to do. Right. Any highlights in terms of the, those initiatives that you're rolling up? None. The brands I've worked for are not relevant whatsoever. Okay. So, no. right. so a lot of cool things, right? You heard earlier about AI. It's a big buzzword. We're doing some gnarly stuff there, too. You know, back in the day, we did some radical things at Shack with regards to kiosks and apps. And, it's always going to continue to evolve, and whether it be natural language processing or edge computing or quantum computing, like all this stuff's going to have a relevance in our industry either in the next six months or the next six years, and we have to get ready for it. Mm. It's going to change dynamically of how we run our businesses. Hold that thought. We're definitely going to come back to it, okay? okay. Yeah. Um, Mike, I'm going to throw it to you now. All right. Great to be here, everyone, and good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Hancock, and I'm the president of Firehouse Subs. Uh, so for the past 10 years, roughly, I've worked with restaurant brands international and, and different brands. Um, first with Burger King, uh, primarily in the US, but a little bit of time in, in Europe, uh, overseeing our Southern Europe, Turkey, and, and Africa business was just an incredible, incredible experience. Um, prior to Firehouse, I spent four years with Tim Hortons in Canada. Do we have any Canadians in the room here? Any hands up here? OK, not a very Canadian room. Here. Whoa, but, OK, uh, yeah. We should have done some research about that before. Yeah, yeah, OK. Normally when I ask that question, I get like at least 10 or 2. Okay, I see a Canadian. There we go. So you know what I'm talking about with Tim's. So Tim's is an incredible, incredible brand. We've got 4,000 locations in Canada, almost one for every nine, 10,000 Canadians in the country. About one-sixth of the country comes every single day. And it's a really beloved, beloved brand in Canada with close to 80% market share in, 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 in coffee. And so uh, it was an incredible experience being up there for four years as the COO there. Um, went through you know, a difficult time, and I think we're really in a, in a good place today as a concept. And then the opportunity happened when RBI acquired Firehouse in uh, the end of 21, start of 22, to come down to another incredible brand. And, and to me, it had a lot of the same fundamentals as to what made Tim so special. So you know, incredible products. We, we, we score you know, number one in terms of hot sandwiches, great guest satisfaction. We score the highest in our, in our space for uh, guest satisfaction and incredible community support. So we're number one in, in supporting our community with our foundation that raises over $11 million per year to go to life-saving equipment. So to me, this was sort of a brand like Tim's in the early stages that we could take to become you know, a scaled national brand from 1,200 to 2,000 to 3,000, 4,000 locations. So, when you talk about what are my you know, priorities, so obviously growth is, is a big one. Uh, incredible fundamentals of the brand that we think we can unlock further to grow the brand. Technology is a big aspect for us. So um, similar to the other folks up here, we have a pretty large digital presence. We're close to 40% digital transactions, but we think we can continue to grow that number you know, quite a bit. And then all that under kind of the fundamental of continuing to grow franchisee profitability. We're fully, basically fully franchise system. We have 40 corporate locations. and year over year continue to grow that number and ultimately drive, drive our business. Wonderful, thank you. Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Ng. Um, I'm the SVP of Design and Construction at Kava Grill. 
Um, we are a Mediterranean fast casual restaurant brand for those of you who might not be familiar with us. Um, <clears throat> so my background is in architecture. Um, I worked for architecture firms for the first several years of my career. Um, when I switched over to the client side, I worked in financial services, I worked for fitness brands, and um, I cut my teeth in the restaurant industry working for Chipotle for about seven years. Um, love the restaurant industry, so happy to be working with Kava now. It's a, it's a fabulous brand, a fabulous organization. Um, right now our main focus is bringing our brand to more guests through um, opening more restaurants um, and not only bringing in the guests but bringing in loyal guests and, and rewarding um, their loyalty. Um, last year we launched a new rebrand which was super exciting, a new logo, a new look and feel for the brand. And this year we are super excited to be um, launching or really rolling out in a big way our new restaurant 3.0 design. Wonderful. Well look, we, we didn't have to play any Oscar music, you guys did it really nice and quick so I appreciate that. Um, let's jump into it. Uh, full disclosure, you know, coming up with these titles for these sessions, these kind of like state of the industry things, it's kind of hard to do to make it interesting. I worked with ChatGPT for an hour to come up with this one and the themes. Actually, it was kind of like me interfacing with my own consciousness and figuring out what we should be talking about. And then I realized, you know, innovate or, or die is, is pretty intense uh, for a Monday morning. But I want to focus on innovation, right? You know, um, you know, what are the things that we need to be actually focusing on, you know, to build the restaurant industry that we want? What are the things that, uh, where are the ideas coming from to get us where we want to be? A couple weeks ago, we did a similar kind of panel at Retail Spaces, and one of our panelists from CVS Health, uh, overseeing design and construction, brought up this idea of creative destruction. Um, so, you know, when you guys approach innovation at your brands, you know, how does that idea sit with you, and how do you guys approach, you know, improving what you're doing when you look to the future? Destruction and die in the same sentence. That's I know great. that's great. It's, yeah, Ominous. Yeah, wordplay. Exudes the job. Yeah, look, you know, we have to innovate. As much as that word is overused and overplayed, you either do it or, to your point, you die. So we continually have to kind of push the envelope to our brands. But more importantly, you've got to keep true to who our brands are. You know, Hardee's is 60 years old. Carl's is 80 years old. Some of our consumers are in that same demographic. So we have to understand exactly what we do technology-wise to make sure it enables it. Because when it comes down to we're, we're in the hospitality industry. We're a fast food concept. It's about getting good quality product at a good quality price in a very efficient manner. So the things that we do when we innovate have to keep those core competencies in mind and in play. So we talked about, we won't go into the details, but we talked about different things that we're putting inside the four walls, but even outside the four walls to enhance that guest experience. So we have to be top of mind because we're all competing for that same guest. And what I might be doing today, they'll do tomorrow and vice versa. But it also has to be relevant what we do inside of our individual restaurants and concepts and being franchisees as well, we're 90 plus percent. We have to make sure those technology investments they do are here to stand the test of time and not be here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think at, at Firehouse, it's a really delicate balance um, because I think first and foremost, we want to preserve what made the brand special, the, the guest service, uh, as I mentioned, the community, the products. Um, and there's so many good fundamentals about the brand, but at the same time, there's so much opportunity we have in terms of innovation. I'll, I'll give you one simple example, which um, is our you know, efficiency in our restaurants. So we're, you know, I'll, I'll self-admit that we're not the fastest concept. Uh, you go to some of our competitors and you're gonna have probably a quicker experience than, our, than ours. I'll put our products head to head with anybody, but our speed uh, you know, is, not, is not there. And that's something that you can see when you walk into a restaurant. It's something when we do guest research, it's always one of the top complaints about our business is we're slower than everybody else. And you know, there's many ways to address speed in your restaurants. Some folks try to change their routines with their team members and their cadences. And, and oftentimes, you know, what ends up happening is you end up having a little bit more of a stressed team member. You end up not having the same you know, guest experience that you'd like. So our goal is we have to preserve the friendliness in our restaurants by getting a bit faster. So we just piloted um, a new kitchen design that we launched in Jacksonville in one of our uh, company restaurants. It's double-sided, similar to what you'd see in many other kind of traditional quick serve restaurants. We redesigned, we brought in you know, uh, an expert from Mercedes-Benz to help design our steamers that basically cook our meats. So we were able to take our cook time from three minutes down to one minute um, and uh, improve overall, overall quality within the product. So to us, that's a huge, a huge win. And if you can shave you know, two minutes through technology and innovation off of your speed, and you can still maintain that spread friendly you know, culture that you have within the restaurant, that is the ultimate win-win. And 
I think across the board, we're trying to take that same mentality. So how do we keep the core and fundamentals of our business, but use technology to unlock a better guest experience? And this is it behind us. Well, okay, we're blocking it, but uh, oh, this is a... Uh, wow. Uh, it's on the side there as well, uh, but that's the, this is the central kitchen, right? Yes. This, okay. Yes, I didn't know you, no, you had this. So I know. Was, surprise, you guys are full yeah. surprises. I got <laughs> up my sleeves. I don't okay. know what else is coming up here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Childhood <laughs> photos. Yeah, no. Okay, great. Amazing. Wonderful. Uh, Melissa. Yeah, I mean, I think creative destruction is, is really just going to manifest itself um, in an evolution of how quickly and how much the world is changing right now. And that evolution is going to come whether we want it to or not, whether we're ready for it or not, and hopefully more of us in this room are ready and prepared for it than, than not. Um, you know, when, when I saw the, the title of the panel, Innovate or Die, I think um, at Kava, innovation for us is as much about executing big strategic initiatives as it is about an innovation mindset and fostering that type of culture within all of our organizations. Um, you know, it's, it's having the freedom to question things, to challenge the status quo, to figure out how to break what already exists and find new and better ways of doing things for our businesses that are gonna, you know, drive our brands forward. Mm -hmm. Phil, you mentioned something I wanna go back to now, just with that in mind then. So like, how do you figure out what the right reinvention is for your brand then? Like, how, how do you not just, you know, annoy your customers and like, oh, I wish they didn't do this. We talked about, you know, drive-through experiences before, like, especially for QSR, like, it's so efficient already, right? And like, so why, you know, if you want to introduce this new fandangled technology-enabled way of doing things, but then it just kind of muddy, muddles up the process. I mean, so how do you toe that line? And you, I'll start with you, Melissa, because you, with a 3.0 kitchen uh, restaurant you mentioned before, so what was the process then getting to that to honor what the customers want? Yeah, I mean, I think when any of us consider or contemplate an innovation, a change, an evolution of our brands, having a really strong, clear brand mission and knowing what your brand is about is so important. Um, at Kava, our, our brand mission is about bringing heart, health, and humanity to food. And whenever we think about a tweak or a strategic initiative, if if that particular thing does not in some way check every single one of those boxes, it's probably not worth pursuing. Um, and so, you know, the advice that I would give anyone is think about your brand and, and use your brand as your guardrails and knowing what to do next. Okay. If I can add one thing to that, I think fundamentally um, any type of innovation within the restaurant has to elevate the guest experience. Too, too many times folks will talk about things like, you know, kiosks, for example, and say the kiosks are great because then we can get, you know, uh, better labor efficiencies, we have fewer team members, and therefore it's the right thing to do. And if that's the output of it, then, then that, that works. But the fundamental decision as to implement something like kiosk or mobile order or whatever is, has to be because it's gonna actually make the guest experience better. For us, I think the, you know, I give the example of the steamers, that's gonna help with in terms of the guest experience. You know, getting higher adoption for mobile order and pay is gonna help with the guest experience. It's gonna make sure that guests have a more predictable time to pick up their food, that order accuracy is higher. So if you're not getting all those benefits and starting with the guest, then, then you know, that's, that's the wrong place to start. Do you have any thoughts there to add, Phil? Totally agree. Like it, that at magic eight ball moment when you decide what you could and could not do. I think you're right. I think so many brands overlook the importance of the guest experience because they're so focused on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And they actually sometimes they cut too many corners that affects negatively the guest experience. And it's very easy for guys like me in my seat or you all into design and development and so forth, to put a technology in that thinks great labor savings, cost efficiency, menu simplification, and lets technology drive it, but so many times that builds friction into the system, and what happens is the adverse effect we're trying to do, which is make a better guest experience. So you're right, our number one ethos again as well is like, how do we take care of the guest? Mm -hmm. And again, fast food is the last thing you kind of think about, you're more about convenience, but I'm telling you, it doesn't matter nowadays because the next generation of the Rebangas want to be known as a person, not just a number in a system. Well, okay, I'm glad you bring that up. And I, you know, you and I had a conversation while we are planning for this, and you, you fly United, right? I do. Okay. Um, you, have my, you have my membership number two on the screen? Uh, well, I do, I'm gonna bring that up right now. Um, no, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you know, you fly United, and it's this wonderful kind of personalized experience, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they know everything about you, they know every, all your preferences, you walk up, you have this experience at the kiosk, and then, bam, you're through, and, and you mentioned like, you know, and you mentioned at the start of this as well, 
restaurant industry is relatively behind in terms of other customer facing experiences that are out there. So how, how, do, you, you know, how do you think about that then? I'm, I'm sort of putting those words back in your mouth in terms of where restaurants can go. Yeah, look, I think it's all about the data, right? We've seen other industries do this. They have a, we have a plethora of data on you right now. If you're part of my loyalty program, I know your likes and dislikes, I know where you buy, I know what you buy, how you buy it, so on and so forth. It's how do you monetize that data and create that one-to-one -one relationship? We all get the generic garbage email that comes out that says, go buy this sandwich. You're like, I don't even like this sandwich. Why are you targeting me that way? Number one. But also number two, you look at it like, how do I hyper-personalize it so I know what you like? And I think as we go through the technology evolution, we, this device becomes even more personalized. Your experience inside the four walls, the drive-through, your ads, like your marketing, your pushes, all become it because you're giving us information. You're giving us part of your soul, terrible word, but I'm gonna say it, okay. as a yeah. guest, because you're giving us your information. And you wanna be given respect back in doing so that we don't abuse the amount of intellect we give to you, the amount of communication we give to you, but more importantly that we're giving you something back beneficially as a consumer. Yeah, it might be your star, it might be a burger, but it's more about who you are and how we treat you as that individual. So yeah, airlines do it great. Healthcare does it even better. Right, travel, how many times you go stay here, or the hotels, you know, all your preferences. It's because at some point along the line, you've given them a data set. And groups are taking that data set, and whether you're using, you know, generative, using machine learning, whatever it might be, you're building these personalization sets, that when we get to the next generation, they can truly really unlock that one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, anything to add? <laughs> Thank you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything to add there at all on any of that? No, I, I mean, I think just a similar vein, I think um, kind of what we talked about, even, even as we think about targeting guests and, and, you know, our loyalty program, it has to go beyond just the fact of, hey, I want to, you know, I think I can give them this right offer at this right time, and then I'm going to drive one incremental transaction. I think it really has to be about elevating the overall guest experience. I think Tim's, my time at Tim's was a good example of that. We had a, our loyalty program, um, we were able to get about a third of the country on the loyalty program. It's, it's pretty unprecedented from a restaurant chain. And we had an entire ecosystem with our loyalty program. So if you download the Tim's app while you're in Canada, you know, on, on hockey nights, you're gonna be able to, there's like a fantasy hockey type game within the, within the Tim's app. We have now financial services integrated into our, into our Tim's app. Um, and we were, you know, really sophisticated in terms of when we gave you the offers and what we gave you and why we gave those to you. So I think it really has to be a very holistic approach in terms of your digital ecosystem, not just, you know, hey, I'm going to send out a targeted email every Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Right. Okay. I also want to talk about surprises in the process. So, Melissa, you know, um, something that we, we've, we've gone through this period now, the last few years, where we, ha we, we had to come up with these solutions to, you know, for very dire issues that were happening in the industry. And uh, one of the things was, you know, digital kitchens. Um, so, and you guys had your iteration of a digital kitchen, right? And I mean, how was that experience for you uh, in terms of how the real world application turned out? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, like, like most of us in the room, way before the pandemic, we were already putting a lot of effort into how to drive our digital um, businesses. Um, and, you know, after we acquired Zoe's Kitchen, we were very opportunistic and took 10 of those locations as an opportunity to convert them into digital kitchens. Um, you know, we learned a lot of uh, lessons from those 10 locations that are open today. Um, I think one of the things that, that we really learned that really spoke to us as um, a brand and what we stand for and kind of touches on some of the themes we've already talked about is we probably push the envelope a little bit too far um, in terms of just driving efficiency, removing friction um, from the guest and um, employee interaction. And what we realized, just collecting anecdotal feedback from both guests as well as crew, is that they were missing the humanity um, that exists within our brand. Um, even though you know, they didn't need to have that full serve line experience, they were still missing the idea that, hey, I can see someone in the kitchen making my food. There's a person on the other side. And even from the crew perspective, you know, they said, oh, you know, even though I'm not interacting with guests um, as I normally would within our standard format, I still like to see people come into the restaurant. I still like to be readily available if someone, you know, has, has a problem with their order or has a question or is, an, is a new guest, right? 
Um, the other thing we're learning from our digital kitchens, because we, you know, we serve digital orders from, from uh, those restaurants, but we also offer catering, and that was a great way for us to introduce um, that line of our business uh, into our portfolio, um, is that these 10 digital kitchens are almost like little mini labs for us to learn about catering, um, what the guest preferences are, um, you know, the operations models, how much uh, prep space is not enough, how much is too much, where and how much hot and cold holding should we have. So, um, you know, we're also learning things about menu innovation and, and what our catering um, offering will look like into the future. So, you know, we've learned a tremendous amount and I think those 10 locations that we have today have given us a really great opportunity to launch catering in the future in a really thoughtful way. Okay. I'm gonna shift some gears now. Um, let's, uh, cause, you know, it's the thing that we're all kind of talking about and is, is in the world today, AI and automation. So, and Phil, I spoke to you, again, talking, coming to our, you know, you use this term, it's, you know, it's an abused kind of topic right now <laughs> because it's everywhere. Um, you know, we could even just come up and say AI and everyone will just start clapping, you know, uh, but like, um, yeah, how are you sort of, again, you, you alluded to how you're dabbling in this, but how are you thinking about making the investments now for down the line? Yeah, so we use AI in our drive throughs right? We're also using it in the back of house right now for reporting and analytics. I think when we look at drive through and what it can do for our industry, it really kind of reduces the mundane task of our team members to have to ask the same question over and over and over again. But at the same time, it also complements the guest experience because it offers a consistent voice and a consistent messaging. So we have about 100 different restaurants right now in some different phase of artificial intelligence at the drive through and again, that word is so overblown and misrepresented. It's basically native language processing, right? So it's taking your voice and digitalizing it and putting it in the POS system and having a conversation with you that takes away that, that guest. What we see the benefit is, is not so much the speed of the drive through but we're seeing an increase in average check because of the continual upsells. But more importantly, we're seeing the increase in our guest satisfaction because the order accuracy is there, because the repeat's back. And then also the intangible is also the employee satisfaction because again, it takes away their tasks, but now they can focus on making quality product rather than having to swap a glove out, pound on a register, put a glove back on, do that whole kind of advantageous thing. We also look at AI, I hate to use the word again, but more of the camera technology outside of the restaurant as well because in drive through it's always been within the loop detector between A and B, which is a point in, when you hit the window, so you hit the drive through menu board in the window and that becomes your metric. That metric is crap. It doesn't mean anything anymore. When people get to the restaurant and they hit the perimeter and they're driving off, they're pulling aside, right? It's an overall good experience thing. So we have camera technology in restaurants as well that know when a car hits, hits the zero barrier. We know when cars, how many cars are in line, when they get pulled off and so forth. So we can better efficiently run the business through that kind of technology. We're not taking your license plate and saying you've pulled up. We're not there yet. Like, besides the lawyers in the room would shoot me if I did anyways. Um, but the cool part about it is that we can see the efficiencies that are potentially gained in, menu, in restaurant design, but more importantly, operational efficiencies inside there. Then there's a the whole data analytics stuff we're doing in the back end. I mentioned earlier with, with machine learning and generative AI and the guest services side as well. So like, we're dabbling in so much of this stuff right now because we still have a labor issue going on. Let's mm. just call it what it is. There's, a, there's not an unlimited amount of time to get things done and, and, a, and a limited amount of resources. So we have to become smarter. And we have to leverage the technology that's out there at our fingertips to make, again, I keep pounding the guest experience. It's ingrained in my, my DNA, the brand I work at. But more importantly, it's like, how do we work smarter? Right? And how do we get the zero time, just in time methodologies going in place rather than you, you hitting us up and then waiting four days for a response? So there's all these different facets we're looking at mm -hmm. from AI. I mean, for, and you're at 100 restaurants with the specific, the, the voice AI, yeah. right? Where are the shortfalls so far with, I mean, that and other elements that you just mentioned then? Well, look, I mean, there's, it's always going to iterate and adjust, right? The biggest thing we have is dialect. The dialect in Southern California, where I'm from, born and raised, is totally different than Alabama. Mm -hmm. Different terminology, different product sequences, so forth. So it's continual evolution and relearning of how the, the NLP actually works, number one. I think number two is that when you start integrating different layers, payments, integrating loyalty, these different avenues of area opportunity, the engine has to become smarter, right? When you start looking at voice and you start talking about the phone we're playing with, where you can actually talk to your phone, hence Siri, place the order, 
that next generation stuff, those are shortcomings that we currently have now. Because we're the infancy of this in our brand. Mm. We truly are. AI has been around for, I mean, even back in 2018 when Google did their thing, when we talked about earlier today about doing voice transactions, um, it can mimic and almost deep fake your voice and don't do my bank account if you pull it out, be bad. Um, but that's where it's going, right? It's been around, it's gonna be early stages now. Give it two or three years, and it's gonna be in every part of our life inside the restaurant industry, including like, you're talking the cashiers are no longer going to Bretton's and saying 86 items. They're talking to a headset, and it goes through the entire ecosystem, digital menu boards, online ordering systems, POS stations. Like, it's just gonna to get to that next evolution. I think everything's gonna be voice activated in some way. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, how do you think about that, Mike? Because, you know, to your point, like it's just in its infancy, and you know, with what you're focused on at Firehouse right now, are you, you know, how much are you dedicating towards that track of innovation? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a couple of very, you know, practical corporate benefits that not just in our industry we're going to see, but I think across the entire industry, whether it's you know using ChatGPT to check your emails or what Copilot's going to be, or I think a lot of media agencies are going to be much more nimble with a lot of the art AI and digital AI. Uh, so I think there's huge opportunities for, for everyone with that, um, within our business in particular. Um, and I kind of throw AI and machine learning, I would say together, I think production, better production management systems are obviously gonna be a near-term opportunity. I think with the drive-throughs, it's something we've done some research on as RBI and done a lot of look at it, sort of the voice activated drive-through. I think it's made a ton of progress. I still think there's some big opportunities in terms of latency. I think it can be a little bit clunkier than, than ideally you would like with a human. I think it will, in the near term, at least have some impact on speed for brands that matters with. Uh, I kind of compare it to like, um, has anyone done like, you know, full, full self-driving in an electric vehicle or in a Tesla? It's sort of like it's on the highway, it works amazing on like the basic functionality. When you go through the neighborhood, you need to make like a complicated U-turn or a left turn or come to a stop sign it's all a little bit clunky and like you sort of want to take it over just because it's so clunky. I think that last 5% is going to take a really long time with cars. I also think that last 5% for us will probably take a while before it becomes really natural and flows like a human and you can cut down that time and you're you know ready for accents and, and variability in terms of requests. So I do think it's made a lot of progress from the fundamentals, but I still think there's, there's probably a while to go. Where I think kind of the, the near term benefit is a lot on order accuracy. So, you know, if you can double check and make sure that, you know, you're using voice AI to recognize what the guest is, is saying. You also have a team member listening on to it. I think that should improve what's being fired into your POS and making sure you have a more accurate order. To me, that's the, the biggest near-term benefit. I think having a fully automated conversation uh, and, it, and doing it really well is probably a little, a little bit further out. Melissa, I saw you were in Ben's presentation earlier, um, which was... I don't know if I, you had the same effect after that, but how did that sort of uh, hit you and seeing all that and, and in your role, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of brands um, look at the, the AI technology and the systems and platforms that are available and we're just like, where do we start, right? Um, and I think a very easy thing that we can all do is look, look and find where the little friction points are for our team members. Um, and, and figure out how we can eliminate that friction or automate a task in a very simple way. And, you know, at Kava, we don't think technology is going to replace people, but it's going to take away some of these mundane tasks and free up their time for things that will be of more value to our businesses and um, will, you know, ultimately serve guests better and drive sales. So really simple example of that is, you know, Bluetooth thermometers. If, if you had Bluetooth thermometers in all of your restaurants, think about the minutes, the cumulative hours that would be saved by not having to manually log food safety temperatures throughout the day, right? And so, you know, that's, that's one aspect of it. But then, oh, hey, that information is automatically going to a log in the cloud that is going to be combined with all of your restaurant's food safety data. Um, so audits are gonna be much easier, right? Centralized audits. And then on top of that, um, you know, there's benefits to the facilities team, right? If there's a problem with a piece of equipment, you don't have to manually find, okay, well, was it the, was it the temperature of the food? Was it a coil? Was it something? All of that data is gonna be at your fingertips. So the cumulative ripple effect, the positive ripple effect of something as small as a Bluetooth thermometer in your restaurant is going to be so powerful in the future, so. Mm -hmm. I wanna come back to those kind of uh, operational things and just talking about labor and the employee experience. But first, before I just finish up this, I guess, AI segment, 
Uh, Phil, I mean, what's your kind of advice? You know, we have a big spread of brands here in terms of size. In terms of invest, making the investment to, you know, get your hands dirty with this stuff right now, and like, I think we can all agree that we, we all need to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how do you know what's the right investment to make, especially if you're smaller and, you know, you're kind of waiting for the big guys to show you what's going to work? Yeah, look, I think it has to fit your brand, right? You may have a, we, we talked about this earlier, Mike, like, you have a technology out there that may not offer a benefit to a drive-through speed of service. So I put it in. I think the AI part of it, since it's a, such a large nomenclature in and of itself, there's bits and pieces that need to play. I think drive-through, and I'll say it again, let the larger chains work out the kinks. And they're gonna be pop-up companies right or left, and there'll be eventually those that come out that'll be basically AI in a box. But it needs to make sense. I don't think you can go rushed into the moment because there is a large learning curve for it, for not only your team members, but for your guests. So you need to have a full 360 approach when deploying this technology inside of your four walls. Size really doesn't matter, per se, of the AI engine. It's how it evolves inside your four walls. So, and it's a long answer to your question, like, I'd say hit punt a little bit, like pause, potentially, and let it vet itself out in this next year before jumping in with two feet. Sure, okay, right. Labor, it's come up already, and um, obviously everyone's facing those kind of issues right now. Uh, you know, availability, uh, you know, um, uh, and the, the cost is one thing. One thing that's popped up in my conversations with everybody is quality of labor, um, and it's just been on the decline in the last few years in terms of that labor pool that's available for various reasons. Uh, you know, there are other opportunities out there these days. Um, we're also dealing with a, a new generation of, people coming into the restaurant industry, we're dealing with the TikTok generation of folks now, so how, how has that come up as an issue for you guys and how are you thinking about that moving forward when it comes to training, hiring in restaurant staff? Uh, sure, I, I, I think, um, so first off, we've, we've done a bunch of research across brands on you know what makes folks wanna work at a QSR restaurant, in particular our brand as well, and the things that you would expect to come up, always come up obviously, Compensation matters a lot. Flexibility in hours matters a lot to people just in general. The one thing that has changed, I think, especially over the past few years, is you know more and more folks want to work in traditional retail. They want to go work in Walmart or Best Buy. It's a little bit less stressful, fewer transactions, um, and sometimes similar compensation. And for us, I think the biggest the biggest thing we're focused on is is how do we improve you know the overall employee value proposition and. Part of that, a big part, is always working in a restaurant is really, really, really hard, and there's options out there that are a bit easier. And so not everyone wants to do that. So I actually think the burden is on us to how do we make our restaurants more efficient, and, and that's a big, you know, big reason why we're so focused on equipment, why we're so focused on technology. It's not to say, hey, let's, let's make it so our restaurants can operate with you know, one half of a person and, and 40 robots. It's how can we make it so our restaurants are more effective, make better products, at a faster pace and an easier pace for our team members. That's a really, really hard group of things to do together. I, I recognize that, but that's really where our, where our focus is, is on. And this challenge is gonna be there you know, for the remainder of time. Um, wages are gonna continue, continue to go up, uh, and there's always gonna be other options for young people to go work in. So we have to make, it's on us to make it the desired place to work. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone in this room or anyone in the world for that matter that hasn't had <clears throat> more than a few moments of self-reflection over the past few years. Um, and we're seeing a trend where people, whether they're our guests, whether they're our employees in the restaurant or in our support centers, that you know people are just tolerating less and they want more these days. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It helps us all raise our standards. And, and more means sometimes more money, better benefits, all of that. But what it really means at its core is that people want more out of their lives, they want more out of you know what they do for work. Um, they want to be more fulfilled, and they want to contribute more. So you know, I think the theme is reduce friction for your employees. Working in a restaurant is really hard. I mean, a lot of the, us that have either had jobs in the restaurant industry or even have done shifts shoulder to shoulder with some of our restaurant crews, it is tough work. And so, as much as we can remove that friction, remove any of the really menial tasks that we can automate. Um, will just allow people to show up in a bigger and better way for our businesses, and it's going to, you know, reap tons of benefits um, moving forward. <laughs> who, just in the show of hands in the room, who, who's worked in a sort of in restaurant gig here? 
industry. I mean, it was my first job, actually. So, um, Did you have anything to add there, Phil? No, it was spot on. I think it also goes back to culture, right? People want to feel appreciated. You want to feel appreciated. I want to feel appreciated. And I think often people want to go to concepts and brands that are not only hip and cool, we can name them on top of our hands, but they feel like they're, they're sustainable, that they're being appreciated for what they do on a daily basis. It's a culture thing. Mm -hmm. And right? I think often culture eat strategy for lunch, as they say, all the time. Well, the, I, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, adding, adding to Phil's point there, too, I think one thing I didn't mention, um, we're fully, you know, as I mentioned, fully franchise system, or basically fully franchise system. For franchise systems out there, I think the burden is even higher on your new franchisee recruitment, um, and also who you're allowing to buy and sell restaurants. You need to have the best of the best today, because it is more difficult to operate than ever before, and you need people who are going to be in their restaurants every day. I know I'm kind of preaching the basics of our industry, but I would say the level of scrutiny that we're trying to put on new franchisees is higher than it's ever been because of that fact of you need someone who's really, really skilled to manage today's generations of team members. Mm -hmm. I do wanna, and that's touching on Phil's point about culture, right? Um, you know, it's just so often, even when I walk into like a hip, cool brand or um, whatever, it's like, it, it's just when it comes to seeing the employees, like sometimes I don't get any eye contact, you know, on, on the line. Uh, or like they're, they're actively kind of belligerent, like slamming things around. And it's like, it's not very pleasant. And I wonder, you know, is there an opportunity to think about this a little differently? We've always seen these jobs as like, it's a stepping stone. It's a thing that you get your career started in, but like then they don't really, they don't really give us stuff about it, you know, and, and it's, it's not an engaging job. Is there a way of like, do you think about this in terms of like, how can we make it more of a career-driven thing? Like you come in, how can we turn our organizations into something that people want to be here and they can see that there's something that they can aim for? Is that something you think about? Or am I just going too tangentially here? Yeah, yeah I think the companies that do it really well promote from within and have sp specific training programs um, and mentorship programs that enable that within their restaurant crews. Um, and, and it's not just restaurant, you know, climbing the ladder in the restaurants themselves, but are there programs whereby maybe somebody is working in a restaurant, but they're in school for design? And is there an opportunity for them to cross over into the support center and become a member of the design team? So just finding opportunities and creating a culture where, um, you know, that sort of thing is, is encouraged is really important. I think on, on, on our end, one thing we're working to formalize, and I think, uh, you know, given that we're franchises, always, you know, on the franchisee managing the direct team members. And you know, again, why it's so important you have the right folks there. But one thing we're working on is having a clear path for team members and general managers to eventually become franchisees in a formalized program where we're actually incentivizing them and working with them and doing a bit more hand-holding than we typically would do at a regular franchisee to you know, get a handful every single year of GMs to become franchisees for us. And, and I think that's a, that's a life-changing path for some of these folks to go from a restaurant general manager to then you know, ideally own five, 10, 15 firehouses at some point. Yeah. One more point around this, and I, I just want to move on. Um, so I, I touched on training. Have you, you guys thinking about that differently in terms of, I mean, do your traditional training programs work anymore for the younger folks that are coming no. into? No, right? Can you get them to sit through? Here's your two days worth of like rote videos and VCRs. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone's making them shorter. Yeah, I mean, we just rolled out a brand new LMS system strictly for that. We reshot everything because everything is done on this, yeah. right? Even though we have a lot of restaurants in California where you can't do things certain ways, thank you, California, um, there are a lot of ways you can leverage a technology to get information out in a readily quick format, but more importantly is how it resonates with them. So our whole new LMS is very fa facebook ishy is the best way to say it, um, because that's how it connects with them. If I were to go do one on, on IT, I would lose three quarters of the, the team. They're like, what are you talking about, you nutball? Like, this is totally different. So it's a radical different platform and a different juxtaposition of how we're treating and changing how we perform. Again, two brands, 50 plus years old, the old ways just don't work nowadays with this next generation of folks. And so we have to be on their level playing teams and you gotta leverage that technology. That's what we're doing from LMS standpoint. So training is radically different. Right. Use TikTok. We have an in-house facility specialist who you know, he found that he was constantly reiterating to restaurant cr crews, okay, here's how you clean the drain sock and here's why it's important. And he's like, I can't keep telling them over and over. So he's like, let me just make a TikTok video and make it available to all of the restaurant crew and they love it. I mean, it's, it's a very easily digestible format that they're used to and it's almost a form of entertainment. Really, that's yeah. so cool. Is anyone else doing that? 
Oh, yeah, right, okay. I use Facebook. Your TikTok's better. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, look, and, and actually, that brings up something else as well. Like, uh, you know, even hiring and applying for jobs is different. Like, you can't even get people to write cover letters anymore, right? Like, it's all kind of like text based or even like as far as that. So, um, just going off on a different tangent then, how, how are you guys building your teams, I guess, uh, not in the restaurant, but the, you know, the teams to get the work done. So, how does that look today, especially after coming through the pandemic? The ways that we work are different. We, you know, uh, distributed work models became a thing. Um, we started interacting more virtually. How has that changed for you now? And then how are you thinking about that moving forward to, to get good people? Yeah, I mean, I'll start. I think number one, most people's first interaction with the brand is through a website or a technology platform. If they get a bad experience in the onboarding or the application process, they're gonna bail. If you walk into a restaurant and say, fill up this piece of paper, like, you are so antiquated, what is wrong with you? So there's solutions and there's tech stacks out there that have the application review, the onboarding, the offboarding, completely automated, even down to managers, it's automatically dropping them on schedules or going through quick interviews because capturing that employee that quick is super important. And even at the corporate level, having that level of automation is incredibly important because people attention span, you mentioned earlier, are super small. They're not gonna wait for two or three days to really get back to them. You have to have an instantaneous platform and a medium that they wanna interact with you on. So we're rolling those out. Again, franchisees are rolling out different systems because we're all competing for that lame, the same level set. But again, my, my initial point was the first thing they're interacting with you is on a device or in some web platform. You've got to make it simplistic as possible, otherwise you're going to bounce. Just, just, just in general, from an organizational standpoint, um, you know, I think there are areas where we've become more flexible. RBI is known for a very strong culture, and I think there are some areas where, where we've become more flexible. But ultimately, you know, I firmly believe that with our industry, we should have less of a hybrid uh, structure. I think more folks in office. And a big reason besides you know, the productivity I feel we get working together and collaborating, I think our team members are in the restaurant every single day, seven days a week, sometimes depending on the restaurant, they're in the restaurant 24 hours a day. As my time at Tim's was really important, especially during COVID. If we ever, you know, we had restrictions there, but if we were doing a franchisee call, we were either you know, in the office or we were in the restaurant with, with our franchisees. And I think the same symbolism is really important in, in our industry that you know, we're, we're not all, especially operations roles, especially folks that are working with operators and working with the team members, that it's not a, it's not a remote job. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an in-restaurant job, it's an in-office job, and, and I think that sends the right, the right message to the greater organization. Yeah, you know, last year we ran some roundtables on like, you know, the future of hybrid work, and what does that look like? And um, uh, there were folks in the room that were sort of, you know, director level, VP level, they said, you know, it's just, all it is is harder work on, our level, like the people that have to manage the people, and they just looked exhausted. So like, I, I totally get your point. And, and you always get, you know, between team members and field teams, you get this perception in organizations of, you know, the, the corporate team is sort of the ivory tower, the corporate team doesn't understand what's really going on day to day in the restaurants. And I think if you want to make that gap even wider, uh, fully work from home and <laughs> don't spend a ton of time in your restaurants. So I think that's, that's the wrong approach. Right. Um, look, I, we're running out of time, surprisingly. Uh, Look, I just want to talk about uh, growth, um, you know, from your guys' perspective. So, uh, obviously, a lot of headwinds over the last few years. What's the situation like for you guys now, especially, you know, you, you're on a tear in terms of growth, right? Um, uh, when it comes to, like, lead, lead times are just sort of ever-increasing. Permitting and inspection times are just ridiculous. Um, what's the lay of the land for you right now? What are you finding? Yeah, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what the cause of all of these delays are, the cost increases. When we think about our own organizations and the challenges that we're facing, right, with resources, manpower, costs going up, and then we think about all of the partners um, that we work with in restaurant development that are facing the same challenges as we are, just as many if not more, from consultants to contractors to all of our vendors to jurisdictional agencies. Um, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what to plan for. Um, you know, and there's, you know, sometimes you can identify, well, HVAC lead times are now like 45 weeks plus, and, and there are certain things that you can do to mitigate those risks, like pre-buy for the following year and what have you. But, um, you know, the approach that we've taken is to really look at the data over the past year or so. Um, and we've done a great job of creating kind of like project or site profiles, right? So like when we get a new site, 
Do we have a project or a set of projects over the last year that have been ground up by landlord, full warm shell work letter in Georgia with you know, X conditions? And what was the data or the delay driver or you know, the delay length that we were seeing on those projects and how do we apply it for more proactive planning in the future? So it's both about trying to mitigate the risks as much as you can and mitigate the cost increases, but looking at your active historic data and keeping that data live so that you can plan in a little bit of contingency um, and not be surprised at the end of the day. Do you have more? Do you have any development tools or project management tools that are emerging, or that you're playing around with to help that process? Yeah, uh, you know, we have a we have a really great um, development project management software. We use Sitefolio, um, and it's you know it's it's somewhat out of the box, but there is some customization, and there are there are certainly more powerful, more customizable tools out there, and more extensive tools. But that was the one that fit for the size of our business and our needs. Um, and it's using that data, but also using some data from operations platforms and you know, tying in and culling as much information as you can and slicing it in a way to help you make better decisions. So you know, it's a combination of a lot of things. So for you, Mike? Yeah, well first I'm glad I get to sit next to Lisa and learn about what you guys are doing. It's incredible what, what Kava is doing. And I think we're, we're in the early innings at Firehouse. Um, you know, we're really excited about the growth we have in front of us, but still pretty early days for us. One of the things you mentioned there was on kind of overall, you know, complexities in the industry. Obviously, getting financing is more difficult or it's much more expensive than it's ever been. And, you know, we're having a record year in terms of profitability for our franchisees, but we really want to get them going in terms of growth. And it's, it's tough to make that commitment when you're paying, you know, 10, 11, 12 percent interest at times. So we launched a program this year. It's the first of its kind that we've launched. Um, we told the franchise system we're going to give $20 million to the system uh, to go towards development. Depending on how many stores you committed to, you got between fifty dollars and $100,000 of cash. It wasn't um, you know, royalty discounts. Some folks do ad fund discounts. Was, we, we wrote you a check. So as soon as you start construction, you get a check from Firehouse Corporate. And it's, it's drawn a ton, a ton of interest. Uh, we had planned to have this program run for nine months to have it filled up. It took us four weeks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so really, really excited about it. And the franchisees really appreciated it because it made that burden a little bit easier in terms of um, you know, financing at the moment. So our, you know, our CapEx is in the four or 450 range. You take 100K off of that, you're putting some equity into the business. Even if you are taking out a loan, if you're taking out a loan at 200K, it's, 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 it's manageable with those type of rates. Um, so I think that you know, it was something that worked really, really well for us and we're looking at you know, how, do we, how do we then leverage a similar program to continue that type of growth that we wanna have. Okay. Well, look, we, we have uh, seven minutes left. Uh, do, we want to open it up for questions. Um, I, I believe we can have a, a roving microphone. Does anyone want to throw something up here? Oh, yeah, right down the front. You've you got to run with that microphone. Yeah. Where? Not right. Just here. Yeah. Yep. I can just no, we'll, we'll want to capture it for the video if that's all right. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, you guys talk a lot about you know the new employees and what's what's that like and the difficulties but you don't talk about the older or hiring older moms and do you see an increase in hiring a more mature demographic of employee sure i mean if they would apply absolutely we don't discriminate whatsoever i mean 100% like if i can get folks that can come work in the restaurant and or the office they would unfortunately the truth of reality is they just don't apply for the qsr rule that's what it comes down to. To follow up on that, though, why do you think that's the case? I think it's a bad mystique, quite frankly. I think, again, let's be honest, standing on your feet 10 hours a day, flipping burgers is not a fun thing. It's, it's a tough job. And a lot of folks don't want to do that. They may be, maybe they're older, maybe they have different disciplines. They're also different skill sets, right? If they can get a corporate job, to earlier was saying that they, it's more aligned with their background, their educational background, professional, like 100%, they would more likely could take that role. And we have positions all over. We have, we have some of our amazing team members with us for 30 plus years, right? That are of the elderly. We have in the Hardy's concept, we, have a, we make our biscuits fresh every day. And those bakers are in there at 4.30 making them. And they're the sweetest elderly folks in the world. We're just not gonna get the same kind of folks that go and wanna work a cashier line. It's just a fact of reality. It's nothing we're actually doing, it's just, how do we make it more enticing, is I guess is the best way to do it. Um, I'd be open to suggestions. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think in our, in our research similar, I think flexibility of hours is always an important thing for, for folks, especially as these larger family commitments. Um, the great thing about Firehouse, I'm gonna make a plug here, is that uh, we've got really you know, one and a half day parts. We start a little bit later, we close a little bit earlier. So uh, if you know some folks that wanna apply, you can send them our way. <laughs> We're gonna sound bite that clip and we'll just put it out there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have another question? Yeah, um, real quick, my name is Nick Voinovich with Little Greek uh, we're, uh, Restaurants. We have 50 fast casual Greek restaurants headquartered in Tampa, Orlando, Dallas mostly. And one thing that's not come up in the session so far is we've seen our um, the third party delivery easy cater go from 16% I know Firehouse is really hitting it hard too. We're up to sometimes some of our stores 70% is now outside. And so our dining rooms were shrinking down, but I was wondering how are you all building that in the model because now we have much more takeout over by the POS systems. We have a lot less, and I go to McDonald's, there's nobody in the dining room. Everybody's going drive through. So I wasn't sure what, and I would like to get Ben's take and also the gal from uh, McDonald's, but you know, what are you all seeing and where do you, does it ultimately, we have restaurants with no seats and where, where's it going to go? Will we all be like Domino's? Is that the future of our, our what is our Domino's? Yeah, sorry. It was back to you guys. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're certainly changing our format based on changing trends. So, you know, prior to COVID, the average firehouse was we were pushing 2,000 square feet, which is extremely large for a, a sub sandwich player. You know, now we're building locations oftentimes 11, 12, 1,300 square feet, um, much smaller dining room packages. Like everybody else, the mix has shift, so far fewer dining than we had before. Third party is massively up. Mobile order and pay is massively up in terms of takeout. You know, the big important piece is it's got to be convenient for our guests. So we went from at the start of COVID that you picked your mobile order up at, you know, on the chip rack. Now we obviously have designated pickup cubbies that are integrated into our kitchen and our newer restaurant. So the design has to be part of it. Um, but we're certainly seeing the same trends. And, and I think, you know, we don't need the same space constraints as we did before. One, it's, you know, it's great in terms of build out costs for our franchisees, but also it gives us access to more locations that we couldn't have gone into before. Yeah, I mean, our, <clears throat> our, our digital business is, I think we've said about 36% of our overall, overall revenue, so not too shabby numbers. And when we have a drive-through, revenues are about 10 to 15% higher on average per unit. Um, <clears throat> but you have to do what's right for your brand, right? Like we, like most of us in the room, are, um, you know, driving digital order sales, but for Kava, um, we still believe that you know the humanity, the the hospitality that's part of our brand is still very much important. With our new 3.0 restaurant design, we want people to feel that hospitality. So you know, dining rooms for us are never going to go away. And in fact, in the 10 digital kitchens that we opened, we actually added seats because people wanted them. Um, but you know, when we talk about hospitality, how do you make that come through in a design? It could be something as simple as a bolster on a bench back, right? Like it looks nice, it's a pretty color, but what does that say to our guest? It's says, we want you to come in, we want you to sit down, we want you to be comfortable and enjoy your meal. So, you know, you just got to do what's right for your brand. I think we have room, for, just one more question, yeah. Perfect. Hi, thank you. Um, so I heard you guys loud and clear that we should always keep guest experience at top of mind when making decisions around how to innovate. What program or system are you guys using to gather your guest satisfaction ratings? So, I mean, we, we, like most folks, we, or many folks, we use SMG as one of our tools, but we do a ton of, we do a ton, a ton of research um, with guests outside of sort of the traditional routes. So when we first acquired the brand, we did the biggest research study we've ever done with the brand. We had over 10,000 guests that, across the country that we were able to survey. Um, we continue to do, you know, several different platforms to research. Um, so I, I do think like that's directionally one helpful tool, uh, but there's many other tools to get a much more comprehensive view of what your guests think of your brand. We, we recently uh, signed up Black Box Intelligence for social reviews, whether it be Google or Yelp or social platforms. We correlate that through our internal channels using some generative IA tools. Amplify is also our customer service tool. And then we tie it back into a CDP. So we all know those folks that have a CDP. We can correlate our loyalty guests and how they're feeding their social reviews as well as their in, in restaurant or outside of restaurant feedback in order to get kind of a pulse. And those scores are important because it's a pulse of the industry. I know how I'm doing compared to my competition in relative BMAs, what we're doing right from price or guest satisfaction. And that really is, when you start taking the next generation back and doing your word cloud, I used to hate that terminology, but we use it, it tells us like what those key indicators are of where we're doing the right things or we're doing the wrong things. And we can make those changes in a real-time fashion rather than 
utilizing an old system. I won't name the name, we got rid of them. Um, similar. But because it was so antiquated, it was not actionable, and that was the issue with us. Yeah, I mean, we're using a number of platforms. We look at Yex data, but <clears throat> I think another thing that um, we do really well is we, we read comments on social media, right? Like our Instagram posts. We um, collect in, uh, anecdotal information from reviews. Um, and a lot of times those comments get funneled up to the, to the top of the chain. So, um, you know, just use as much data as you can. Look at informal as well as formal um, vehicles for collecting guest, guest uh, sentiment. We're really out of time. I want to thank you for this, but uh, you know, just one last question. Phil, you brought up something when we were talking. It's like, organizationally, where do you get your ideas from? Right? Like, you know, where, where, what, what is happening in your organization? Like, how are you coming together? One of, the things, one of the reasons we expanded the scope of this event from design and build to sort of bring in uh, tech and you know, how that's changing things is because we noticed there wasn't as much cross-collaboration as it's needed in, in, in organizations. So, yeah. Where do you get your ideas from? How do you structure your, your businesses to? Science fiction novels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Right. <laughs> no. Uh, honestly, it's, it's stuff like this. It's collaboration with people. It's also looking outside the industry and grabbing the little bits of cookie crumbs and seeing what could fit and what couldn't fit inside of our industry. That's really what it is, quite frankly. And just radically have a war room of folks, peers, my teams, and just throwing ideas at a wall and seeing sometimes what sticks. And one out of 10 might stick, and all of a sudden, it's a revolutionary thing that we always wanted to do. There's no wrong answer in trying something new, and so it's an open book. Last thoughts? Yeah. 30 seconds, 40 seconds? I'll, I'll say I think you, get, uh, you have to have a culture of collaboration where both from your team members, your restaurant team members, your corporate team members, your franchisees feel comfortable you know, bringing great ideas to the table. I joke in our organization, you know, some folks are used to, this is my lane, I want to stay in my lane. There are no lanes, this is a pool with no lanes and everyone swims in each other's lanes and if you're in ops and you want to bring an idea about development, you should be doing that. If you're in development and you want to bring an idea about marketing, you should be doing that. So really fostering that, that culture in, in the organization and then I think personally just being like as obsessive as you can about the industry on your phone, you know, set all the news alerts to all of your competitors so you're constantly reading you know, about what they're doing. Late at night, read some Reddit comments about what they're saying about your brand. Like you have to be, you have to be obsessive. Well, Reddit, I didn't expect that. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> Melissa, you want to bring it home? Yeah, I mean, what these guys said. Plus, you know, when you're when you're testing um, quickly, don't test something and forget about it, right? Like, look look at what you're doing and and the KPIs that you set against any initiative, and don't forget to revisit it and and make sure you can adjust on the fly. Um, but yeah, I mean, opportunities like this to network, to figure out what your peers, you know, not competitors are doing, letting some of the bigger players make the mistakes first and, and figure it out and then kind of adopt what makes sense for your brand is, is really important. This has been super cool. Thank you guys so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you guys.